since um, I started studying the Bible. So I got a bunch of notes and I just want to go through and read them. So I'm just going to start, I'm, I'm going to probably be doing a lot of reading out of my notes, um, but we're going to also look at a bunch of scripture too. So uh, the first thing that what I want to start out with is talking about the issues with the text because the reality of what we're going to be talking about today is that you cannot know this outside, for, for English speaking people, this doctrine is not found outside a King James Bible. The King James Bible is the only Bible where this doctrine um, uh, can be found. The doctrine of right division is completely removed from the modern translations. Now, there are some, I haven't seen this myself, but I've talked to Brian about this, and I think he's um, maybe had some exposure to some who try to teach right division out of a modern translation, but um, my, my understanding is that, you know, that's, it gets, gets a little weird, and they didn't get that from that Bible. They got it from a King James Bible. So I want to talk about, I want to be gentle and sensitive with this, you know, in case there's somebody out there watching that has never been exposed to this truth. But we have to talk about the issues of the text before we can talk about right division. Um, and the attitude that we should have toward the Bible um, is... It's a very important thing for me um, in, in this lesson to talk about that because honestly, when I came unto the knowledge of this truth, it was a struggle. You know, I, and I wanted to know. You know, I, when I first learned that there were corruptions in the Bible and, you know, I, this, this just came in my radar, right? <clears throat> that was very interesting to me. And I, I wanted to know as much as possible about this. I, I've spent a lot of time studying this. Brian has done some amazing uh, lessons on this, so have some of the other men here. Um, but it is not a small topic. It's very deep and broad, but there are some basics that we're gonna talk about this morning just to break the surface of this and break, you know, break the ice, so to speak. But um, I wanna start out with um, the believing attitude that we should have. And so just to go to my notes, um, the believing attitude toward the Bible is it's the word of God, not the words of men. It is without error. If there is an error, it's an error in my understanding. God set things up that the scriptures must be studied. This means careful study and yielding to what the scriptures say, not relying on personal revelation or, or private interpretation or understanding. Uh, for example, um, there's... Now, I know that we do have the Holy Spirit in us, and um, we are to be Spirit-led, but um, relying on a voice inside of you um, to provide you with truth, Re relying on a fresh word from the Lord. You know, there's a lot of churches out there that um, do things like, hey, I've got, a, you know, somebody will, the pastor or somebody will stand up and say, I've got a fresh word from the Lord this week. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that we have the complete word of God. It is settled. The scriptures themselves say that the scriptures are forever settled in heaven. So for us to be relying upon our doctrines and the truth based on what we've perceived to received from an inner voice or some special personal revelation does not line up with what the Bible teaches us. So, again, God set it up that we are to study the scriptures and we have the complete word of God so they're in the scriptures themselves. We have everything that we need. You know, we haven't been left without anything, which is another good point to consider, and again, I want to be gentle with this stuff because I myself came from this, and um, we don't need anything else other than what we have 
everything that we need that God intended for us to have, we have right here in our King James Bible while we are alive here on this earth during our life. So, um, and I'm just going to continue with my notes. We have the complete Word of God, and it contains everything God wants us to know about Him, His dealings with mankind, and most importantly, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how we are saved. There's no other knowledge or special revelation needed. And again, that thinking and is that we don't need that. We have the complete Word of God. Um, so verses that teach us how to think about the scriptures, uh, come with me to Proverbs 3, 5, and get Psalm 118 in the other hand. Proverbs 3, 5, and Psalm 118. Proverbs 3, 5 uh, says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Right there again, um, the scriptures are teaching us that our own understanding. And, and for me, that, that absolutely is talking about any special voice that I would receive or special revelation that I think that I've received. If it's not found in the scriptures that's not something that I should be yielding to. It's not something that I should be relying on as the truth. Um, uh, Psalm uh, 118, uh, verse 8, says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I myself personally can um, speak about this. I used to go to my pastor all the time and ask him about the Bible. I never read it. <laughs> And that's, I mean, the, the fruit of that was complete ignorance with the Word of God. I never knew anything. In fact, my wife and I, when the first time we came to this church, um, we, yeah, I, I don't remember what Brian taught on that day, but we, we sat through um, the first sermon here, and we were just going through Scripture by Scripture like Brian was doing. And... We both looked at each other after, I think I told you this before, Brian, but we looked at each other after that sermon was done, and we're like, Poof. I don't think we've ever learned that much. And it's, but it, it was just a normal sermon, you know, but I, I'm trying to set this up to, to point out that not only do we need to rely upon what the scriptures say, but the scriptures themselves are sufficient. They, this the, the Word of God is what works effectually in us. You know, not Brian or me going off into a tangent and talking about all of our experiences or bringing in a bunch of things, you know, that are not in the Scriptures, but the Scriptures speak for themselves. And that's different from what I was exposed to growing up. I come from the Methodist Church, and the Methodist Church does a lot of well, it's, there's a lot of things that are watered down. They're, you know, mixed together. It can get quite confusing. And I never, not, not only did I not study the scriptures, but I never was exposed to teachings that really shined that light, you know. And again, that's because two things. Um, the Bible that they were teaching from was not a King James Bible. Um, and I, I want to say this with... Um, with some great sensitivity here, but when you come unto the knowledge of the truth that the Bible, um, the text of the Bible, that the modern translations are different, that they come from a different text, that the King James Bible is the preserved word of God, when you come unto the, that knowledge, you soon realize that the scriptures that have been removed and changed can no longer be the word of God. And I think... Um, that that is one of the, the greatest things that was a, 
a hindrance in my spiritual life growing up is that I was really never, you know, taught. Um, the pastors that I listened to, they never taught out of the King James Bible. Um, and the fruit of that, again, was confusion and ignorance. So, um, come with me to 2 Peter one twenty. Okay, 2 Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Again, the, when we as members of the body of Christ study the Scriptures and discuss it between each other, or teach it, or handle it in any way, it needs to be done according to the Scriptures. It's not, there's no special revelation that we are to bring into that that's outside of what is written. Because what is written is settled. It's done. It's what God intended for us to have. And now back in the Old Testament, there was all sort there was a lot of different things going on, but we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. The, not the same, there, there are different spiritual things occurring now that used to occur back in uh, time past. We do not have an angel that appears to us and gives us a word from the Lord. We don't have that stuff happening right now. So that, that kind of thinking, um, and again, this is very prevalent out there in uh, the majority of churches um, that are self-professing Christian churches. But what the scriptures, um, what the scriptures teach us are, are things like um, not leaning on our own understanding that there's no private interpretation of scripture um, in fact come with me to first corinthians 2 13 and we'll we got one more thing here and then move on first corinthians 2 13 says let me make sure i'm in the same in the right spot here yep um which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Excuse me. So that, to me, is another verse that teaches us that we should not be relying on special revelation or a voice inside of us um, that for, for our truth, because the Holy Ghost teaches us the Scriptures. Now, how that's done is when you study the Bible, and the Bible does what it says it's going to do. It's, it's not the words of men, it's the word of God. And when you read the actual words of God, it works. And it is just like Hebrews 4.12 said, the word of, uh, says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. And so for me, setting all this up, uh, I want to talk about, try to, you know, encourage us to think about that the scriptures are our final authority. That they are everything that we need for anything that we need to discuss about um, God and his dealings um, with the body of Christ in time past and in uh, the time still yet to come. So, I'm uh, just going to go to my notes here. These scriptures teach us that we are to put our trust in the Word of God, not men. That God has given us teachers, but when you study the scriptures for yourself, it is the Holy Ghost that teaches you. That there is no private interpretation we should have, but yielding to what the scriptures say. If there's something we hear that causes us to go, wait a second... We should go to the scriptures to see if what we heard is the truth. This is why we say the Bible is our final authority. In fact, uh, come with me to Acts 17. I think this is... Um, got this in my notes here. I think this is the verse that talks about the, um, the, the Bereans in... Yeah, Acts 17, verses 10 and 11. 
And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more notable than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And, and check this out. And searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So <laughs> everything that I'm going to talk about this morning, don't take my word for it. You know, I'm a man. I'm going to be discussing what the scriptures say, and hopefully, um, you'll will be edified by these things. But that was my pattern in time past. I used to go to my pastor and rely upon him, and and that's unfortunately what a lot of people do. There's there's entire religions built on this, where there's a mediator between the laity and the Word of God, and God would have us to study the scriptures, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved of God, uh, proved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I know this is all stuff that we are, you know, very, um, this is, we go over this stuff a lot here, but um, I've never taught this before, so uh, that's why I wanted to go through some of this stuff leading up to it. Um, so, this is why we say that the Bible is our final authority. Not only does it tell us not to put our trust in, in men or in special revelation, that those things aren't even happening right now, but that we are to study the scriptures. And that the reason why we are to do that is because the, the word of God says, yea, like, uh, I think, I can't remember where this is, but let God be true and every man a liar. Right? So... You know, I, I love everyone here. I love Brian, but if Brian's up there, and, and, and just like me, not picking on Brian, but if he's up there and he's saying something, and go to the scriptures. It's my job to do that. You know, it's not my fault if I'm deceived. I mean, it's not Brian's, well, going a little too far there, but <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that, you know, if there's a pastor that's, you know, teaching things, if you're just relying on hearing the sermon and then going about the rest of your week without studying the scriptures for yourself, that's a dangerous thing to do because you're then taking that man's word as your final authority without seeing if whether those things that he teaches are, are true or not. And before I go any further, I, I remember when I was learning all of this, when all of this was just you know, starting to sink in. I called Brian and I, I said, I never realized how bad things really are. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I came to that, you know, he said he had that moment himself at some point and he knew exactly what I meant. I really didn't even have to explain it to him. And, but that, what I meant by that was the system of religion that I grew up in, which is a system, it's the system, the religious system of this world, did not teach me anything like what I now know based off of reading the scriptures for myself. And when I think about not only are we as Christians up against, you know, well, where is the word of God? You know, even if you have that question, it's, you need, you need a little help in this so that you can be, so that you can come unto the knowledge of the truth. But um, it's, it's not just that there are churches that teach things that are wrong. It's that they don't even have the complete word of God. They don't have what God intended them to have. They have a Bible that has been changed. There have been many alterations made to it. I mean, a lot. And that, again, is a large topic to get into, and it's, it's a very personal and sensitive one because people are very attached to their Bibles, and I completely get it. You know, even when I wanted to know the truth and was starting to yield to the, the King James Bible, and, you know, it's, it just doesn't happen overnight, but even with the attitude of wanting to do that, I still found myself going to my NLT and reading it sometimes because, I, you know, the King James Bible, I had that same excuse. Well, it's, you know, this, I like the way this Bible reads. It's a little easier for me to read. And, and uh, I, 
it, it didn't really work out that well for me. So um, to get back on my notes here, our final authority and absolute assurance that it is without error, come with me to John 12, 48. Now this for me is one of the coolest verses in the Bible, you know, talking about the preservation of God's word. Uh, John 12, 48 says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Those, that's what Jesus Christ spoke. So what does it say there? It says, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The word. Those words are going to judge men in the last day. Who's the word of God? Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the word of God. Uh, in fact, the Lord himself says um, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And it's just... I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but for me, it's, it's just now that I know these things, it's weird when you hear men say that things like, well, you know, we don't have the scriptures, you know, they, they were lost and, you know, we're trying, you know, like, like text critics talk about. Um, and if you've never been exposed to the term text critics, it's men that have taken up the uh, duty, um, self um, appointed duty of reconstructing the text of the Bible, um, criticizing and uh, making judgments on what the Bible should be. And, and that's how the modern translations are. That's, that's what they are built upon, is that, that thinking. So, it, again, it's just absolutely amazing to me that there could be um, the thinking that God has not preserved his word because, again, if he's going to use his word to judge men in the last day, then he absolutely has to preserve it. It can never be lost. It has to be preserved. Otherwise, God would be unjust and he would be a liar. And we know that, that that's just not something that could ever be of God. God can never do that. So the doctrine of preservation for me, John uh, 12, 48, is a very powerful verse for this. So uh, read my notes here. The verse, this verse absolutely teaches us that the word of God cannot have errors in it and that God must preserve it. Why? Because if the word of God shall judge men in the last day, then God must preserve the scriptures to judge them. This means that the scriptures can never be lost. They can never disappear like some men teach Text critics, uh, like the men behind the modern translations, say that since we don't have the originals, that they have taken up the task of reconstructing the Word of God. That's why the modern translations continue to change. That text is never settled. But the scriptures say in Psalm 119.89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Think about that for a second. It is true we don't have the originals, and since God promised to preserve his word, and he must do this, how has it been preserved? Where is it? You know, we talk a lot about this here, and I, I myself personally, I love this topic because it's vast, and it's very deep, and there's a lot of eye-opening stuff in it, and it's been very edifying for me. Um, but... That thinking that, you know, we need to go and find the originals in the sand somewhere in the desert, right? Well, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> not yet. It's not going to. But we've been now 2,000 years on, on this side of the cross, and that hasn't happened. We do not have the originals. So the thinking that we would need to have them is just kind of a little weird to me because God has seen fit not to preserve his word by having the original somewhere in like a glass frame that we can always go back to and see how he's preserved them is through copies. 
It's that simple. Faithful men of God have always copied the scriptures. And just like, you know, Moses received the Ten Commandments, right? And he broke the first set, right? What did God do? He made a second copy. God's okay with making copies. Because it's the word of God. If it's a copy of the original, and that continues to be copied, it never ceases to be the word of God. And if you think about it, that God's preserving his word, and that those copies are continuing to preserve his word because they say the same thing, and they continue to say the same thing, that's exactly what we see when we look in history, too. As you know, Brian's done a lot of you know, good lessons on this. We have videos here um, through the church that go into this stuff very eye-opening and, and educational on this topic, but that's, it's that simple. You know, there's a lot of people out there that will say that we don't have the Bible. It's, you know, we don't, you know, there's no doctrines that are changed in the modern translations and, you know, we, just all sorts of excuses and uh, things that would, they're just doubt. You know, they're, they're men and doubt. And I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but that's the reality of the situation. Um, so that's, again, when I talked to Brian that day, I was like, starting to realize, I never realized how bad it actually is out there. It's not just that we have men that, you know, teach things that they shouldn't be teaching, but there's a plethora. There's, I mean, hundreds of English Bibles, modern translations that don't even agree with each other. And they come from a different Greek. You know, most people don't even know about Westcott and Hort and what they did in the 1800s. They have no idea about this stuff. And if, you know, if you've never heard about that, I would encourage you to look up Westcott and Hort because that's, there's some real eye-opening stuff there. Um, but God has preserved his word and we have it in our King James Bible. And we here at um, Grace Life, we don't like to, you know, come across, we don't intend to ever, to just be sounding like we're, you know, dogmatic and strict and, you know, puffed up, you know, that we believe only the King James Bible and that somehow we're better than others or anything like that. No, you know, we just, through, through careful study of the scriptures, we've come to realize and, and, and understand and believe that the, the preserved word of God for English Bibles is found in the King James Bible. So, um, Continuing about uh, the preservation of God's word, this also means that the uncorrupt word of God throughout time has always been available and able to be located. We as the body of Christ know that God has preserved his word throughout history through copies. It's, it's that simple. Since it is God's responsibility to preserve the scriptures, he has done this through faithful men that have diligently copied the scriptures over and over again. You don't need originals if you have a copy that says the same thing as the originals. We have proof that God is okay with copies because, again, we talked about Moses. That's Exodus 34, verse 1, by the way. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, too, because it kind of sounds like God's a little annoyed with Moses. Like, okay, you broke those. I'll make you another one. He's, I don't think so, but for me, I think it's funny. Um, can we see the pattern of God's word being copied through history? Yes, we can. Um, now, Brian would know more about this uh, than I do or be able to speak more clearly on this. But in short, there are over 5,000 manuscript witnesses that support the text that our King James Bible comes from. And the modern translations come from a handful of manuscripts that don't even agree with each other and that have no historical providence showing that they were ever used by the body of Christ. You know, they just, they appeared in the uh, 1500s, the Codex Vaticanus, is that right? It was logged in the Vatican Library in 1475. Yeah, okay, so 1475, Codex Vaticanus comes on the scene, and the 1800s, you know, Codex Sinaiticus is found in, you know, trash can, whatever, in Mount Sinai by Tischendorf. Is that right, mm -hmm. Tischendorf? Yeah, it's been a while since I've thought about that. So, again, mm -hmm. these manuscripts... Um, not only do they disagree with the received text and the, those 5,000 manuscripts, that, that's, it's called the received text, you know, the, the Greek New Testament that we have. 
and um, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, you know, behind the Old Testament, we have both of those things, and they've been preserved through copies. Uh, but the text the modern translations come from do not agree with that. They, they say different things. And there's, there's entire scriptures that have been removed out of, out of that text. So, again, um, going back to my notes, uh, that there are over 5,000 manuscript witnesses that support the text of our King James Bible. They all agree with one another, meaning they report the same information about God. Now, there are text changes. We've talked about this before. You know, the King James Bible, there's been some changes in the text, but none of those changes have changed the meaning. The modern translations make changes that change the meaning. Like, it no longer means what God said for it to mean. It, you know, for example, 1 Corinthians 1.18, um, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. Is that past tense? It's past tense. When you believed the gospel, did you get saved? Yes. Okay, oh, wait a second. Are you sure about that? Or are you being saved? Because do those things mean the same thing? Are you in a process of salvation? No. Are there churches out there that teach that there's a process of salvation? Yeah. yeah. I know it's one verse. There is a lot more, but... That should be an eye-opener to us. And again, that thinking of yielding to what the scriptures say. No matter what my flesh or my mind, my carnal mind is thinking like, ah, that's a bunch of hooey-fooey or whatever. That's just your flesh. And again, that's, that's part of the coming unto the knowledge of the truth that it's hard to yield to the word of God sometimes, especially when you have an established thinking in place and that's what I can testify to I had that um, and the only thing that broke it down it wasn't Brian that broke it down it wasn't any other pastor it was reading the scriptures for myself you know and just like all of us here you know that's the word that works effectually in us um, so um, if you are reading scripture that's been altered so it no longer means what God said, then faith cannot come from hearing those words. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, if it is true that the modern, and it is, that the modern translations have changed scripture so that it no longer means what God intended it to mean, it's no longer the word of God, it's the word of men. And when you're reading those verses, and there's a lot of them, Faith, it's not possible for Romans 10, 17 to be true in that Bible. Because if you're reading the words of men, faith cannot come from hearing those words. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not the word of men. So when those, the, that's why it's so important to understand this stuff. Um, and, you know, another quick one here is that God is not the author of confusion. That verse always blows me away because, you know, Bibles have what? They, they have an author. <laughs> Modern translations have an author behind them. I would encourage you to think about who that author is. Because if they've been changed and altered, that's not the Holy Spirit that's the author behind that. So, um, I'm kind of running out of time here. But we know that God cannot lie. Um, and since God cannot lie, this means that we need to know where the Word of God is. Um, because there are many Bibles that say different things. We know and believe the Word of God for English-speaking people is located in the King James Bible. And... Okay. Okay, so... I'm going to start um, talking about some uh, right division now. I also want to convey this teaching from the point of view of someone coming from the Methodist religion and never hearing anything about it, uh, about right division. Uh, when I first started learning about right division, it was a challenge to my established thinking, but I wanted to know the truth. And when I looked at the scriptures for myself, I couldn't deny what they were saying. Yeah, my wife and I experienced this. There were a lot of, you know, sermons that, you know, we, we heard, you know, Brian uh, preach and teach on. And we came, you know, home and we we're like, I don't know about that, you know, because it goes against 
some of the things that, not everything, of course, right? But some things, you know, that correction. You know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for what? Correction. The word of God will correct you. And that's, that's an uncomfortable thing sometimes, especially when you have a thousand quadrillion churches out there that teach things that would be not that, that, that set things up so that you don't think like that um, so again it's it's understanding that it's the word of God that um, we should be yielding to not you know our experiences or what you know men teach we need to make sure that if we hear a teaching that it lines up with what the scriptures say so simply put, right division is about studying and understanding the differences in the Bible because there are differences. Uh, there are differences about God's dealings with mankind in different time periods, differences with instructions, and even salvation. Um, yeah, I don't have time to read these notes. Well, again, I just want to encourage uh, everybody watching and here to not take my word for any of this, but to look at the scriptures for yourself. Um, and I also fully understand that if I'm teaching something that's not true, that I'm going to answer to the Lord for that at the judgment seat of Christ. So in preparing for this lesson and in my studies, this isn't just something I decided to do over the weekend and, and slap together. I've spent a lot of time studying this myself because if I ever teach it like I'm doing this morning, I want to make sure that it's the truth. Because I know who I'm going to answer to. And so, I mean, I, I think that that should also be part of our thinking, you know, that the things that we say to each other, you know, that those idle words or, or vain words, you know, they can really, you know, hurt someone. They can, they can drop their understanding down. They can confuse them. So, you know, we want to make sure that when we speak and we talk about the Word of God, that we're doing it from... Um, perspective or, or we're doing it from a place uh, of knowing the truth and trying to be gentle and conveying that truth um, sometimes um, so second Timothy 2 15 uh, says study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth God tells us in this verse that we are to study the scriptures there's some key points here that we are to study there's also the reality of being approved or disapproved by God for our, with our study. Uh, this approval or disapproval will happen at the judgment seat of Christ, where each member of the body of Christ shall be judged according to what was done in our body. This means teaching and preaching the truth, and whether or not a man has done this in a manner that's acceptable and pleasing to God. Again, Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's not talking about salvation. That's talking about your ministry here on earth and whether or not it was pleasing and approved by God because you can be studying things that are not, you can be teaching things that are not true or you can be teaching the truth. Uh, this verse also tells us that we are to rightly divide the scriptures. Uh, the word rightly dividing um, in our King James Bible means to cut straight. And if you think about, you know, I mean, just literally interpret that scripture. Rightly divide means to cut straight. So that should tell us that there are divisions in our Bible. And the word divide in the English language is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it conveys the understanding of not having things overlap or being mixed together, right? Okay, so... Uh, the command to rightly divide also tells us that there is a possibility of wrongly dividing the scriptures. Um, the modern translations remove this doctrine, which is why I've spent so much time talking about the issues of the text. It's gone longer than I thought, but um, that's why it's so important to know where the Word of God is. And if you, this is the first time you're hearing this, to give that, I would encourage you to give that some thought and to look into it for yourself. Just a simple few searches on the internet about the corruption of the Word of God can yield some avenues that, you know, you might want to check out. But we also believe that 
there's more to it than that in terms of understanding the corruption that's happened because we have an adversary. The devil is still at work. And the scriptures themselves say, Paul said that we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Many. When Paul was writing, when the scriptures were being written, there, were there, was it a scattered thing here and there of, of the word of God being corrupted? No, there were many that were doing that. That has not ceased until this day. Uh, it, it continues unto this day. And this was and still is Satan's plan. Um, what were the first words the devil spoke to Eve? Yea, hath, hath God said. I mean, think about that for a second. If we are to think that there's not been any corruptions made to the Bible, then that would be... I think that that's being very blind about the reality of what the devil is doing. Because the first thing he said to Eve is, Yea, hath God said. Meaning, is that what really God said? And, and don't we find that exact same pattern in the modern translations? Because when you get into debates with men about this subject, there's a lot of things that go back and forth about, Yeah, yeah, this, and yeah, yeah, but... And there's all these excuses... To me, that's that subtlety. That's that stronghold in a person's thinking that's been built up. And it's been built up because, you know, they haven't been yielding to the scriptures. So, um, okay, there are differences in the Bible. When a person uh, reads the Bible, they usually want to know, what is God's will for my life? Where are my instructions? Uh, we understand here um, at Grace Life and that the instructions for the body of Christ are found in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, um, and that the body of uh, Christ is part of the mystery that was kept hid, that was kept secret in God, hid in God from before the world began. So I want to talk about, since I don't have a lot of time here, um, I want to talk about the different, uh, that we have different Gospels in our Bible. Because to me, this is a very eye-opening topic. So there are a lot out there that teach um, that there is one Gospel in the Bible, right? You guys heard that? You ever been exposed to that? Okay, that's what I came from, was that. So did Peter and Paul preach the same Gospel? Because the, the term, uh, the gospel, just means good news. Did they preach the same good news? There are many that teach there is only one gospel in the Bible that Peter and Paul preach the same thing. Come with me to Acts 1.6. Acts 1.6. speed it up a little bit here. Acts 1, 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to who? Israel. Israel. The disciples knew about the prophesied kingdom, that the Messiah would come and set up his kingdom. They were looking forward to this. The kingdom is, the that kingdom that's being referred to there is the millennial uh, kingdom, the, the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, the physical kingdom here on earth. And we know that that has not happened yet. That that's something that's still going to happen in the future. Uh, this, uh, the earthly kingdom where Christ will rule with a rod of iron for a thousand years. Come with me in Matthew 4, 17. Boy, when you do this, I, I, I again, I didn't think I had enough material. <laughs> I'm nowhere, I'm nowhere near going through everything. Man. Okay, Matthew 4, 17. So I'm going to speed it up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, kingdom of heaven. Come with me to Matthew 4, 23. And there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee and from... Oh, wait a second. Matthew 4, 23. Oh, Sorry. I was reading the wrong verse. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. That's the millennial kingdom. 
that the disciples knew about, that was prophesied since the world began, that we know of as the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. It's, it's not something that was hid. It was talked about. Um, come with me to Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, we're going to come back to that verse because that verse is extremely interesting if you've never thought about this before because the Lord says, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. We're going to come back to that. Come with me to Mark 1, 5. One fifteen. sorry. Uh, this is the Lord speaking here. And saying, uh, Mark one fifteen, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? At hand. Near. near. The Lord was telling them that the kingdom was near, that it was about to come, that it was near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So the gospel that the Lord himself preached and taught the disciples is the gospel of the kingdom. So Peter and the 12 preached the gospel of the kingdom. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught them. Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. And was it different? So come with me to Galatians 1, verse 11 through 17. I'm just going to start reading this because I'm running out of time. But I certify you, brethren, this is Paul, but I cert, uh, Galatians 1, 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Wait a second. Paul says his gospel is not after man. Did Paul know who Peter and the 12 were? Mm -hmm. Did he know what they taught? Mm -hmm. So if Paul did not receive his gospel from men, and he knew what Peter and the Twelve were teaching and preaching. He knew the gospel of the kingdom that they preached and taught because that's what he was doing to the early church. He was killing the early Christians that were teaching and preaching that gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Paul persecuted them. So when he says, is not after man, he cannot be talking about the same gospel that Peter and the Twelve were, uh, were preaching. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. There it was. He didn't learn it from Peter the Twelve. But by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to talk about, you know, how he persecuted the Jews. And um, I'm going to go to uh, verse 17. Um, uh, let's go to verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul did not go to the other apostles and, and, and talk about what it, it, he did not confer with flesh and blood. And verse 17 even uh, tells us more about this. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. So again, these are different gospels. Paul was given the gospel of the grace of God. Come with me to uh, Galatians 2, 1 through 2. Uh, then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. And who is anyone here a member of the nation of Israel? Are we Gentiles? Yeah. yeah. Who's our apostle? Paul. Paul says that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. The Lord said that he would send Paul to the Gentiles. Now, Paul went to the Jews first, right? Because to the Jew first and also to the Greek, but Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He has a different gospel, the gospel that was hid in God, the mystery. That's why we talk about, when you look at the prophetic scriptures going through time, 
Um, it, when you get to the stoning of Stephen, and when you understand what really happened there, that the Lord Jesus Christ, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up into heaven and saw the Lord standing. What was about to happen? Judgment. judgment. And what was next after that judgment? Was it, was it going to be wrath? Was it going to be the tribulation period? Yes, it was. And they knew that. Those men that killed Stephen were not just mad at him because he was preaching a murder indictment unto them that they killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They knew when Stephen, because Stephen just, it's not just written that Stephen saw that, he also said it. They heard him say that he see, that he's seen the Lord standing. And what is uh, Psalm 110? Yeah. Um, the Lord standeth to plead and to what? Judge. Judge. So when Jesus Christ was standing, when Stephen saw him, those men, the, the leaders of the nation of Israel, killed Stephen because they knew what was about to happen. They knew what was about to come. And, and my personal opinion is they, they didn't want to give up their authority and, uh, you know, get utterly corrupt. But we know that because that happened and the nation of Israel fell, because they had already rejected God the Father in the Old Testament, they killed their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Stephen being full of who? The Holy Ghost. They killed Stephen. They, they rejected God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What other parts of the Godhead is left to reject? Right? God's given them every single chance. This is the nation of Israel, his chosen people, that had always, in time past, preeminence. They were above Gentiles. You know, this was not, this is not, you know, hidden knowledge. This is, you can look this up in the Old Testament. But when the stoning of Stephen happened, God could have brought in the tribulation period and then the millennial kingdom of Christ because Jesus himself said the kingdom is what? It's at hand. This wasn't, when Stephen was stoned, this wasn't long after, you know, that after the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, was, was crucified. It wasn't, you know, th that long after, you know, this happened to Stephen. Not, I don't remember, I don't know how many years myself, but it's not 2000, right? And this was in a short period of time that this happened. So um, we know that when that happened, the nation of Israel was diminished, that they fell. And in, um, I can't remember, Romans, I think, or Ephesians talks about this but rather through their fall, talking about Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, salvation was always available to the Gentiles in time past, but they had to go through Israel to get it. You had to become a Jew or you had to bless because God said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. So we have a different gospel, the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. For me, it's this simple. Um, God saved Paul on the road to Damascus and gave him the ministry of reconciliation, the gospel of the grace of God. And that is that all men, there is no preeminence with men right now. There's no nation of Israel that has preeminence over Gentiles right now, that we are all on the same level and that we all can be saved simply by believing what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The gospel of our salvation is in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 1 through 4. That's a different gospel. And it's, that is a critical part of right division because, again, right division is just simply looking at the differences in the Bible and understanding, like, how, how can this be? Because the Lord told the rich young ruler, right? Here's another example. Uh, the rich young ruler came to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and asked him, what must I do to have eternal life? And he said, you know, you've got to keep the commandments. Don't commit adultery. He says, I've done all that stuff. And then what does he say? Well, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven, right? And, you know, he was sad and he went away because, you know, he, he had a lot of wealth. Wait a second. So we're saved simply by believing that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Do we have to do what the rich young ruler was instructed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to do. 
Is that how we are saved? Do we have to do that stuff to be saved? Because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Right? We are not under the law. There's a lot to talk about there. So I want to close here with uh, something that I think we'll find very interesting. Let's see what Peter had to say about Paul's teachings. Because again, if Peter and Paul preached the same thing... Um, well, let's just look at this here. Go, come with me to 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Okay, now this is Peter talking towards the end of his life. And uh, verse 15 says, An account of that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, wait a second. If Peter preached the same thing that Paul preached... Why would Peter find it hard to be understood? Why would he find Paul's epistles, some things, um, hard to be understood? And also, Peter refers to Paul's epistles as Scripture. You know, what, what does it say? Paul, of course, according to the... Um, where does, where's the word Scripture? End of 16. End of 16? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, which they that are unlearned, the end of verse 16, and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures. So Peter is acknowledging that Paul's epistles are scripture. And he says that there's things there that are hard to be understood. If they preached the same thing, then Peter would not be confused about what Paul was teaching. So... <laughs> I'm pretty much done here, but I just want to read my notes here. More than this, we know that Paul's gospel and ministry is part of the mystery. So Peter and the Twelve could not have known about the gospel of the grace of God during the Lord's earthly ministry. And the Lord did not talk about the gospel of the grace of God because it was revealed to Paul. It was revealed in due time. God had a set time where he was going to reveal the, the grace of God and he did that to Paul. And you know, we believe all of the Bible. We study the entire scriptures and, and we trust them and we know that every word of God is true. But we also know that there are scriptures that are written directly to us and for us as the body of Christ that contain our instructions. And there are other scriptures that are for us that we are to learn about because they are profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, right? But we also know that those scriptures are not our instructions. Like the instruction for the rich young ruler, what he had to do, being under the law, those are not our instructions. And it's that simple. Um, so since I'm out of time here, um, Romans 16.25. Um, come with me there real quick and then I'm going to close up here. This to me is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. Um, Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. That gospel was given to Paul and Paul only. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since when? Since the world began. And Ephesians says, you know, um, that the secret was hidden God. So we know where it was. God hid this in himself. And we also, uh, do I have like another minute? No. No? Okay. Yeah, close up. Okay, so, um, and, just to summarize here, right division for me um, and just the basics of, you know, kind of touching on this are that there are differences in the Bible and that's okay. It's, it's, that's what the scriptures themselves teach. 
for us not to be scared of that or to be thinking, you know, well, wait a second, the first time you hear this, you're like, well, that's, I don't know about that. But study the scriptures and, and, and read them for yourselves. And you'll see that right division is not only something that God intended for us to do, but it, it, it's, it opens up the Bible so you don't understand the whole thing. So that's, that's it. And uh, I'm going to be doing another lesson, so it's going to be part two on this. And um, so hopefully I'll get through the rest of my notes on that lesson. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg. All right, thanks, Craig. And uh, we are past time, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, shut this down. I believe Will's teaching next week. And then two weeks from today, Craig's going to teach again, so he'll just said he'll do part two. So anyway, thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming out. Uh, Craig, you're going to want to check the comments on the live chat after they populate tomorrow morning. There's some nice encouragement there for you uh, from the lesson. That's what I was doing, monitoring that. So anyway, uh, those of you that are with us, we'll be back live again at about 1040 with our